Anyway, that's just exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, welcome to you all, wonderful people. I'm Anne Catherine, co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life, a group of companies dedicated to change healthcare through functional medicine and personalized medicine. It's December. I put on my green top because I thought it's like Christmas colors. Um, but December actually means something a little bit else for Nordic and DNA Life because as you probably know, um, our warehouse is in England and there's this little issue called Brexit. Um, but I just want you practitioners to know that you really rest assured because we have your back. We are looking after you. Um, we have perhaps for the last six months, months um, ensured that we have a streamless new distribution center in Holland. So all orders to the EU will be distributed from uh, Holland. And now I'm talking about supplements. Right now, we don't exactly know with lab tests, but this is supplements. But I don't think it's going to be a problem at all with uh, lab tests. So we will keep you updated with any news. But really just lean back and enjoy the easy ride with us. We're doing the hard work for you. Um, and just do ask questions if there's anything. But we will send out um, mails and information about this. But um, so far, there should be absolutely no problems. The next webinar we have is on the 10th of December with Helen Gauchi, our genetic expert, where she deeps into the or dives deep into the interpretation of the Grow Baby test that we are going to talk about today. So health ownership for the future generations, that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we have two wonderful ladies uh, with us. Um, Leslie Stones. Um, I was first introduced to Leslie and she probably wasn't even aware of it, but that was in South Africa. I think it was 2014 when uh, you and Michael did a head to toe conference. <laughs> and I was really impressed with their baby knowledge. So um, Leslie is a, is a medical doctor and she's been delivering babies since 1982 and has delivered more than 5,000 children. So her passion is to help parents through functional medicine and lifestyle changes really to create healthy little miracles. And functional medicine uh, does not really work without proper nutrition. And that's what Emily Ridbone stands for. She has several certifications in nutrition and she's been working clinically with pregnancy for the last 10 years. And she's co-authored the article, and I'm gonna read up now, customized nutritional enhancement for pregnant women appears to lower incidence of common maternal and neonatal complications. And it was printed in Global Advanced Advances in Health and Medicine. And I'm gonna share the, um, the article with you uh, when we send out the, um, the recording for today. So, and, and you can see they look alike. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mother and daughter. Um, but remember the purpose of these webinars for you practitioners is of course to learn but it's also to create a family friend community united and I'm part here with us. So please ask questions on the side. I will put the questions uh, down, note them down. And then uh, at the end, there will be time for Q&A. But you can write your questions on the side and I'll take note of them on the side and, and bring them up um, at, at the end. So enough from me. Let's pass the stage on to these amazing ladies. And I'm in love with them already. So I hope you will be as well. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. See you. As always. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share our screen. So just bear with me yes, for one moment do that. while I do so. OK, I'm Yay. hoping, Catherine, can you confirm? Yes, yep. looks okay. very good. Great. All right, I think I'll start off. I'm Leslie Stone and Emily right beside me here. Um, we both had the uh, blessing of being able to drive into the Grow Baby office today in front of the most spectacular sunrise. It just was filled with pinks and peaches and mauves and blues. It was just spectacular. It reminded me of, reminded us of how much life there is to share here which also brings me to the wonderful gratitude that we have um, for being able to uh, join, collaborate with DNA Life. This was one part of our program, Grow Baby Health, that we were unable to accomplish in a, in a concise and doable manner. And that is to be able to incorporate uh, gene variants and the implications of those variants for 
key maternal and baby outcomes that do drive our health and resilience for not only us as adults, but our generations to come. And so this is a key piece that is now being actuated and I couldn't be, we could not be more grateful for it. So I feel like I'm gonna start briefly by saying um, how our trajectory brought us here, that, you know, how our path brought us here. So I have been, as you know, practicing for at least delivering my first baby in 1982. I think we started out there in um, Maricopa, Arizona, but then ended up in Thailand, all sorts of different experiences. Uh, ending finally with a private practice here in Ashland, Oregon, in the Southern part of our beautiful state. And, found that our key nutrient interventions, like one at a time, just wasn't answering the uh, problems that are commonly found in pregnancy. And the common findings are uh, things like trouble with hypertension in the mom, trouble with uh, diabetes in the mom, uh, trouble with certain outcomes at all, all in the baby that, again, produce a resilience or maybe a vulnerability for chronic disease in their futures. So um, this became obvious to us that each of our individual interventions never seemed to make a dent in those kinds of outcomes. Then came along this concept of developmental programming, um, probably made most famous by David Barker, but lots of people have weighed in on this subject that key plastic time periods, time periods in which we can make a, uh, a, a profound influence of, in the health of our generations, start before you ever conceive. They start in the, that, uh, particularly in the three months beforehand, but you know, leading up to that, developing great health and resilience in, those, in the mother and the father. And then that, and then, it leading on to uh, through pregnancy, but even extending beyond. We'll cover that. There are many interventions. Um, we'll just move on to the next slide here. Oh, there we go. Hang on. Go ahead. There we go. So in that background of knowing that, um, that maternal health and paternal health has, the, has a very profound impact on the health of that pregnancy. And the key, we found that there are four key um, birth outcomes or phenotypes that predict whether that, um, that offspring is gonna be healthy and whether their generations are gonna be healthy. And those key outcomes are being, that you can see it at the top of the page there, too stressed, Meaning if the mother was too stressed without mitigating interventions, without modifiers, then that baby has a particular type of a stress phenotype called, that we call stress dysregulation phenotype. And then being too early, preterm birth, a remarkable um, increasing frequency condition that truly predicts you know, health or resiliency um, and can comprom compromise it if we don't address that particular um, issue, being too small for whatever age you're born at, not having the proper growth, that turns out to be the highest predictor of chronic disease. Um, and being too large, um, it has, is probably the next one underneath that. Those are mediated. Those four particular birth phenotypes are where we're gonna be focusing with our, with our program of Grow Baby Health and this additional gene variant panel that helps us um, predict vulnerabilities and meet their needs. So what are those, um, what are those types of um, mediators? Well, if we don't have proper um, micronutrients, if we have maternal um, high blood pressure, if we have maternal uh, gestational diabetes, if we have under and over nutrition, if we have seasonal compromises of nutrition, if we are um, uh, exposed to multiple toxins that take away, that demand more of our immune system and detox system than we can possibly meet. Um, common toxins that we all know about, the smoking, the alcohol, uh, infectious diseases, 
periodontal disease is one that we often forget about, but we figure that for, for preterm birth particularly, it is very likely to be um, about 50% of preterm births, periodontal disease is implicated. And so, and using that um, preterm birth example, that baby, if, you, if that baby is born too early or too small, then that baby is likely as she grows up and becomes a mother herself, is very likely that grand, that child is likely to be a, um, also delivering too early and the next generation too early. And we end up producing this feed forward uh, condition that ultimately ends up with an increased risk for chronic diseases that as you are all aware, um, now are, implicate, are increasing to epidemic proportions across the globe. Where do we intervene? Well, the good news with all of this developmental programming information, our explosion of the Human Genome Project, we have ways to intervene. We are empowered to be able to do something very powerful. So going on to the next slide, um, we recognize now that, now that we have enough information, we have enough um, epidemiology that comes from studying of all of these gene variants, that the example of preterm birth again is that there are over 200 different SNPs associated with preterm birth. And we are able to focus on several of those in this new uh, panel that you are going to be um, exposed to. You have an opportunity to involve in your care of your patients. Most powerfully, preconception, I will reiterate. So I'm going to use, uh, I think, methylation as our. Um, car to drive through, or maybe as our legs to drive through this concept that we're, um, we're talking about today. So um, going back to single carbon metabolism, I'll just give a little brief uh, review of what that uh, means. It, underneath some of these uh, banners, you will see um, several cycles uh, being projected. And they start um, in many places, but the impactful space that I'm going to start with this is this MTHFR, that methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase um, gene. And I'm going to, and we know that when we enter this single carbon metabolism, uh, being able to produce uh, a, 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 yeah, a methyl group that can be sent out to all these different cycles, impacting neurotransmitter function, impacting um, uh, detoxification, DNA repair, protein synthesis, bone health, um, in, inflammatory, urea uh, uh, um, cycle, um, yeah, neural toxins. In the center of all this is this single methyl group. Well, key um, to, the, to our um, understanding and our kind of aha moment for um, the developmental programming aspect of in the power of knowing your gene variants is that um, a wonderful woman named um, Dr. Schmidt down in just south of us in Northern California found that if um, mothers had the MTHFR gene or they had the CBS gene, and you can see CBS is over on the right-hand side of your screen. The MTHFR gene is over on the uh, left side of your screen. Or if the baby had a COMT gene, that's the one right in the middle, the blue, the blue circle there, that if that mom three months beforehand and one month after did not have B vitamin neutriture, you know, folic acid, B12, B6, B3, then those babies had the MT, if, they, if the mom had the MTHFR gene, then the odds ratio of that baby having um, autism was 4.5. 4.5 times more likely to have autism if they just didn't have the B vitamin literature. CBS for the mother, 2.6 times. For the child, if that child came out with a COMT gene, seven times more likely to have autism if she just hadn't had that preconceptual B vitamin literature. So I tell you, this lit a fire under us, <laughs> like you can not believe. Here was an actionable, simple thing if we just knew about it. Right? So that again, it reemphasizes 
how important that time period is. I do not want to neglect, however. So we, we have preconception. We need to know the health of the mom, the health of that dad. We need to know their vulnerabilities. We need to know um, in, in gene variants, but we also need to know their micronutriture. We need to know these pieces about them. We need to know their stress load. We need to know their microbiome. We need to know all of these things about them because yes, it impacts us very powerfully in this, this which seems like an incredibly narrow time period. However, this process, this, this ability to be plastic and, and manipulate our health, it continues to be very powerful at least through those first four years and five years. And yes, it does continue throughout life, but this is the time period that we can really, this is something you can bite off and chew on. This is something we can really do something about in a very highly um, motivational time period for people who are trying to have babies or who are thinking about it, think, are conceiving about conceiving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on one more, thank you. So that brings us to what did we find after we um, uh, we felt we just weren't getting anywhere with this concept of a single manipulation being effective. So what we thought is, wait a minute, there are lots of um, there are lots of thought leaders out there. Um, Ames is one of them with this triage theory that it's multiple micronutrients, multiple macronutrients, multiple stressors, multiple variables at one time that need to be um, considered. In order, to, uh, in order to gain a positive benefit. So we took that much more systems-based, which lends itself to that functional medicine model, and we decided to interrogate our mothers by looking at, um, uh, by looking at their um, key micronutrients that we found to be commonly deficient that also influence, you know, enzyme cofactor capabilities, um, DNA methylation, all of the other factors that we know um, produce good health um, and resilience <clears throat> that manipulate the gene and, and manipulate the phenotype is what I mean to say. So we decided to take our population and compare it to this, the um, population that delivers in our hospital here in Ashland, Oregon. And we looked at their um, micronutriture in the form of vitamin D and in uh, carnitine and zinc. We made assumptions about uh, epidemiologically based uh, assumptions about their ability, uh, their um, lack of e essential fats, their lack of adequate intracellular magnesium, and um, their uh, consumption of a standard American diet. So we thought about that. Uh, we interrogated their diets for um, what their macronutriture also included and what the effect of their eating would have on their microbiome. We looked at two specific, at this time, we looked at two specific gene variants and that was their MTHFR and their COMT. And we made specific targeted interventions based on this initial analysis. Then, because we know that developmental programming, what your needs are unique from trimester to trimester. They're unique preconception, they're unique pre uh, trimester to by trimester, and even into that postpartum time period, we developed, and I should say Emily largely developed, um, a, uh, a targeted nutritional and lifestyle approach that included these gene variants and, um, and and developed a program around a doable group um, management program around that um, in that setting. And what we found, and then we followed these um, women uh, through their uh, through their pregnancies, and um, found that we looked at first at their yeah oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. yeah there we go <laughs> we looked at first at their outcomes their um, gestational diabetes and their um, gestational hypertension or preeclampsia lumped together there. There being two, those babies being too big and too small. And also I won't, it's not so here, shown here, but also preterm births, very, very important piece. And we found that compared to everyone else, that our numbers were statistically reduced and we are the ones in the green there. So we're way down below um, two percent for the most part, and you can see what the other um, markers for the our, our region, our state, our community, um, and the globe. 
So we were, and, and I will say that there's nothing, you don't see any green on the SGA, the small for gestational age. And the preterm birth was also, we had none, we had none compared to a global rate, um, anywhere from seven to 18%. Malawi was 18%. Yeah. yeah. So we went, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, maybe, we, maybe we've got something here. Um, you know, if there was a, yeah, so yeah, we had to move one more. So then we followed this. This was in 2014 that that data was published and it represented 2011 and 2012 outcomes. So then we followed our data through 2017, giving us a much larger N number. I mean, the first one was- 111. Yeah, 111, and this one's over 410. And we again found that our conditions were consistent. We did end up having a few um, preterm births, but they were, nobody was below 36 weeks. And that the primary morbidity, of course, with preterm birth is the, uh, is the neurologic and cardiopulmonary complications that come, and those only come if you're below the 36 week mark. So we felt, and, and that number, that N number there, you can't see it. So we had um, six births over those um, five years um, that were between 36 and one seventh and 36 and six sevenths weeks. Mm -hmm. Then we also had, then we now had the opportunity to take a look at our, that developmental programming piece. We didn't have anybody old enough to be able to say what happens as a young adult. I will add though, that there's plenty of data to show that there is durability to these outcomes. Um, they've been followed since 1985 and all the prospective studies that have been done show durability of whatever complication that you received. So our autism rates way down, our atopic dermatitis rates way down, our allergy in general way down. And so we're quite encouraged to say that this um, um, targeted individual taking into account these um, gene variants manipulations and then meeting them in a doable, empowering way, giving the you know, handoff to the parents that uh, this gives them plenty of tools to do something about. And in fact, we um, decided that what we should really do to convince people and ourselves was try to figure out how many people, uh, people are probably familiar with this type of statistic, and that is how many people do you have to treat in order to show a positive benefit. Um, and it turns out that if we take all of our, um, all of our uh, maternal outcomes and, um, and baby phenotypes, baby outcomes, um, that those combined, you have to treat 24 individuals in order to get a, a positive, a, a reduction of one. Um, Preterm births, you only have to treat 16, 16 and a half. And for example, if we take a look at drug trials, a, uh, a, people are happy if you can have, I use statins because it's the ones that um, comes to mind for me. And if uh, people are to take uh, a statin drug to lower their cholesterol, you have to treat 54 individuals in order to get a positive outcome. And by the time you hit about 100 individuals, you're starting to get negative outcomes with it. So we have no negative outcomes and it takes 16 to get a reduction in preterm birth across, and so this is a population statistic, of course, it doesn't represent the individual. And again, those preterm births are better than 36 weeks, nobody below that. So join up with DNA Life. So the piece that we were having a hard time getting done all of these last years was to be able to say, but we know that there are many other gene variants that um, have an overlapping uh, compounding effect on the health and resilience of those babies, those mothers and those babies. And so DNA Life was able to put together um, many of these most impactful gene variants that are represented inside this Venn diagram. And so let's go to the top of this page. The, um, for example, let's start with that. Let's start with preterm birth. 
again. So you see that is that light lavender color on the right, upper right of your screen. It's all of the uh, gene variants that are involved with preterm birth um, are covered by that light lavender disc. And so the, the VDR, the you know, vitamin D receptor, the progen um, receptor, APOE2, the detoxification enzyme, CYP1A1, all of those are involved with preterm birth. But they are also, as you can see, if we cut over to small for gestational age, VDR is shared by small for gestational age. That MTHFR um, gene is um, shared by, um, by, you can see all of the overlapping in, you know, by small for gestational age, preterm birth, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia. It just becomes such a powerful thing that if we find the interventions that can cover each of the, that, that cover each of these um, polymorphisms, each of these SNPs, then we can potentially maximize these outcomes. So why were these ones particularly chosen? Because there are things that we can do in terms of lifestyle and nutrition and stress modification. So that's the basis of this. And I, I hope that you guys can appreciate the, um, the overlap and power that it has, that you will have by uh, utilizing this um, gene map, basically, gene variant map. So since we're using methylation as our, um, as our uh, what do we call it, a car or legs to get us um, through this discussion, then this is what this report will look like. Methylation, we'll talk about um, what it is that it does in the, in the top of this. And you can see that it's involved in so many, um, so many uh, outcomes yes, related to pregnancy, but also um, related to our uh, chronic conditions. And then we'll take a look at which of these genes are involved and whether the emphasis, um, you know, which ones we have to emphasize. And then we'll move on. Yeah, and so uh, you can see all the different gene variants there. Let me see if we go on to the next page, or is this the, is that, okay, this is it, okay. So um, you can see that, uh, yeah, CBS, so that's, that, that's, in that, um, that's in that same example that we um, talked about earlier for autism, the um, CHDH, the COMT, uh, again, one we talked about in the MTHFR. All of these have, um, they, you, these results will tell you where we need to, um, where the gene variant exists. And then the next page will tell us what it is that you need to do about it. And actually I should say not the next page, but Emily Ridbaum will tell us what it is that we need to do about it in a concise and readable manner, in readable manner. So I get the fortunate opportunity to try to, and to, um not try to, but also to empower the mother to be able to take this information and to apply it in her own life. And I think one of the most profound um, moments that we recognized in our clinical practice was that we never had a more motivated person sitting in front of us as a pregnant woman who was on the, the, the budding edge of having a baby desiring deeply to want to know what they could do to optimize their overall health, not only for their child, but also for themselves. And so when you think about the stages of change, most of us live in this pre-contemplative space. Some of us move into the, you know, into the contemplation and then <clears throat> consistently for some and not so much for others, we move into the actionable space. This never, this time period of pregnancy, this time period of preconception offers a true opportunity for a motivated person to want to be able to change. And we have seen habit formation occur quickly. We have seen it be durable and we have seen it be sustainable in its way that it was carried on and truly changed generationally for the mother and for their, and for their offspring. And so I think that's the most exciting part of what we get to do is not only do we get to take and assess the individual always, but we get to utilize this time period, preconception, 
through the first thousand days and beyond, as Leslie said, in this first four years, and really control what we can about the situation, recognizing that, as we all know, there are a multitude of factors that can influence the way that our genes work. That idea of, of <clears throat> epigenetics is exciting because it suggests that potentially we're not in this stagnant place, that we can see genetic expression change without you know, without the changes in this, the sequence of the base pairing, but that we can optimize their function, turning them on and off depending on what we need them to do. And that's, the, that's why we're, we are using methylation in this case, because it has such an amazing penetrance. It works redundantly so frequently in these main, main physiological systems within our body as Leslie elucidated in that methylation map. But ones that I think are important to recognize, especially now in our COVID landscape, um, with the pandemic being what it is, is these nutrients have the opportunity to also provide an immense amount of immune resilience, which is another kind of key caveat to, to optimizing the health and resilience transgenerationally and for the lifetime of, of, of the mother baby dyad and also the father coming in. And so what you'll see here are, th this is not a comprehensive list of methyl donors as you all will see, but these do have phenomenal physiological redundancy and they have actionable um, impact on the genes that are involved in our methylate and the methylation panel in, the, in our grow baby DNA life genetic test. So I, I, what I would like to do here is maybe just spend a little bit of time kind of walking through how I would think about this if somebody were to come to me with, with this lab result. After, of course, I had the opportunity to speak with Leslie, the dynamic that we share in clinic, just for you all to know, um, is that Leslie and I maintain what is called a standard of care plus model of OB care and in the United States that includes anywhere from 10 to 14 OB visits covered under the global insurance program. Um, and, but what happens in between, I think, is, is, is the plus component of what we do, which is this is where we insert um, uh, an individualized nutrition plan for each woman coming into our, our clinic, where we're able to target with genetic information, with additional lab information, and with their current lifestyle and nutrition, we're able to make these changes and target them more directly. So in the case of choline and B12 and folate, B2 and B6, if we spend just a little bit of time and quickly look over that, the first thing that stands out to me is this is not going to be applicable and these food sources are not necessarily going to be applicable for every single woman should their dietary preferences be something other than an omnivore or if they were to present with maybe some hyperallergenic food response to eggs, to fish, in the case of, of choline to peanuts as well. And so we have to think beyond just here are some top food choices is how is this woman going to be, going to be able to apply these food choices within their own diet in pregnancy? And so what I do and what we continue to do is we take there and, and we have codified this information on what is called an a one carbon metabolism core food plan, which we're able to adjust by trimester, because as we know in the first trimester is, is marks uh, uh, organogenesis and, and, and massive cellular differentiation. Um, and in the second trimester, we have the continuation of that cellular pro proliferation and then into bone, um, the bone matrices and also into palate development. And then the third trimester, we have this massive neurodevelopment and the continuation of of the maturity of these organ systems. And so what we're able to do is to address these trimester by trimester needs with a massive overlay of this filter of what are also additional one carbon metabolism needs based on this woman's genetics sitting in front of me. And so choline, choline is interesting. I think, um, you, you know, when there is such a prolific need for things like folate in pregnancy, and as we know with the fortification of, of, of our grains, um, in some countries in this world, we have seen a massive decrease in neural tube defects. But in folks who do present with MTHFR polymorphisms, folic acid, um, you know, circulating in the peripheral system can also be toxic because they lack the ability to create that enzymatic breakdown. And so we have to make sure that when we are addressing these needs that we are looking at it kind of in this full 360 degree view. 
And one of the ways that we do that is with these recommendations. So generally speaking, we understand that methyl rich foods and remember again that methylation really for me is um, they, they, they suggest cofactors, they are influencers, they exert massive enzymatic reactions in the body, they recycle um, enzymatic reaction in the body, they help, they help create and, and, and allow um, for the creation of, of, of that universal methadone um, S-adenosyl methionine. Um, and so what we have to do is make sure that through these dark leafy greens and animal proteins and nuts and seeds that we're meeting the needs of this mother choline rich foods. Again, coming back to choline, um, when there is such a marked need for folic acid, um, it, it suggests that there may not additional beyond what, what might be needed um, in pregnancy and maybe perhaps genetically. It also suggests that we may have a dietary insufficiency of choline. And then if you use epidemiological studies, you know, there's a really large 14 year study about just basic dietary intake of choline it's estimated that females get about 294 milligrams of choline every day in their diet. Um, but that hinges upon many things. And we also understand that in pregnancy, choline requirements, just baseline choline requirements, irrespective if you have a PEMT um, polymorphism, is more like 450 milligrams to 550 milligrams. And so how do you make up that gap? And if for some reason you have a woman presenting who doesn't particularly like eggs or who doesn't eat soy or who doesn't eat peanuts and, and maybe is having a very massive first trimester food aversion to fish, how do you meet the needs of that woman where her choline needs? Well, then we have to think about using what we call um, supplements as a bridge or we're using these therapeutic nutrients as a bridge. And so in the case of of choline supplementation, we have to also look at what is most bioavailable for this woman in pregnancy. It looks like choline salts do the best job, um, citicoline also, um, but if you look into supplemental phosphatidylcholine, we have to remember that only 13% of, of, of uh, phosphatidylcholine is actual, is actual choline in its activation. And so between diet and making sure that we're, we're supplementing with the appropriate form, we can meet the needs of, of, the, of PEMT for the mother and of course for choline um, in neurodevelopment of the, of the child as we're learning that choline, this vitamin-like nutrient, not only can be protective um, for the, the fetal brain and can optimize fetal brain development, but promising for information, I think that Dr. Michael Stone spoke about um, while in South Africa, um, was its role and potential um, impactful timing associated with decreasing the risk of the adverse effects of fetal alcohol syndrome um, should the mother be engaging in, in alcohol intake um, in pregnancy. And so it looks like choline is going to be a reigning hero for us in, in, in methylation. If you take choline and betaine, and then additionally methionine, which we know methionine can help convert into that uh, S-adenosyl methionine, that, that main universal donor, um, that we know that those three methyl groups seem to have and ha that have the largest impact in methylation. And all of these other nutrients that we know, the B vitamins, the omega-3 fatty acid, iron, zinc, and methyl adaptogens help allow um, appropriate balance of methylation in the body. Because we're starting to learn about this concept of overmethylation and undermethylation. And one of the wonderful things about utilizing um, herbs and spices that can be methyl adaptogens is that it helps to bring balance um, similar to the way you would think of an adaptogenic herb um, in adrenal function to help manage stress resilience. You can think about these methyl adaptogens as ways to provide better resilience for methylation patterns. And I think it's also important to say that you know, this is metabolic methylation, but we're also talking about DNA methylation because DNA methylation, it appears to be when there's higher oxidative stress, so that 8-oxy-deoxyguanosine, when there's that high oxidative stress marker, that is when we're seeing the sperm fragmentation, the DNA sperm fragmentation that has higher association with, with miscarriages and recurrent pregnancy loss, irrespective of any DNA methylation changes that might be happening in the mother. The father also has a key pivotal influencing 
role. And so these methylation adaptogens provide an opportunity that feels simple because for me and, and Catherine and I were just giggling over text before this, we were both making tea. So many of these can be consumed in tea form. So we don't have to think beyond like, how am I supposed to sit here and cook with curcumin? I don't know how to cook or what do I do with this rosemary or, or whatever it might be. And so on our methylation, one carbon metabolism food plan, I've intentionally put herbs and spices in, in the color in a, in a box in the color of a sandbox because as children we all love to play in the sandbox right but i think in the kitchen we have forgotten the power of herbs and spices and the ability to modify health response and improve those health outcomes and so i always encourage mothers go, go play in the sandbox go play in the sandbox and it's a good little cue for them to remember that their lifestyle choices are powerful and that play play in the kitchen and play otherwise as we're going to see over in, in stress um, response it is a powerful thing to include every single day for some folks um, particularly for some folks who are slow metabolizers of comt um, I think it's important to recognize that caffeine can be an antagonist for them. But I also think on the flip side of that, if you aren't presenting with COMT, um, so uh, metabolism, that then there are there are protective aspects of utilizing um, the polyphenol uh, uh, phytonutrients that are, are in herbal teas or in black caffeinated teas or green teas or coffee. Um, and during pregnancy, just making sure that we're keeping that thr threshold less than 200 milligrams is really, really critical. Is really critical. But yeah. for some folks, that metabolism of caffeine is not effective, and it is stimulating, and it doesn't make people feel good, and it it, it causes panic attacks, and it is an anxiety provoking. And so we have to remember that this is so much in context of of who is sitting in front of you and what those gene results are saying. Supporting your gut. Um, I think that you know, if we spend any time in the next 10 years um, looking at anything, it's going to be how impressive and powerful bacteria is. As we all know, we are primarily bacterial cells more than we are human cells. Um, but one of the really neat things that we are starting to learn is that our, back, our gut bacteria and that optimal flora, um, when it is balanced, has and does have a preferential capability to create B vitamins, um, particularly B12. But there is some level of B vitamin creation by the gut bacteria that we, that we harbor. And so ensuring that we are um, appropriately addressing prebiotic fibers, which as we all know, digestion wise, we cannot break down in our small intestine, which cue the probiotic bacteria that can help break it down. It provides that fuel. And then we do get to see the benefits of short chain fatty acids and decreasing inflammation, improving immune resilience. Um, and so this baseline concept of, you know, when you see under nutrients and the focus on emphasis on nutrition and see under nutrients at the baseline, what's your baseline intake of a quality prenatal vitamin? Because I think the other thing that we've recognized, and I myself went through the Grow Baby Health program, just so you know, and I did it to a T. I'm telling you, like I was, it was like perfection, which I always say your body doesn't need you to be perfect. It needs you to be consistent. But I just was, I'm going to do this. I'm going to execute. I, I, you know, I was very, I was exerting my type A effort 100%. My poor child, I think he's going to be fine. Um, anyway, so what ended up happening was I, was I recognized that between the issues that I had with nausea, in the first trimester, the intense fatigue that exists in the first trimester into the second trimester, the heartburn that all of a sudden hits you, the restless legs, the poor sleep, the, I, oh my gosh, it just felt like all of these challenges were mounting against my deep desire to want to execute this very, very well. And it did not it, it, it did not matter if I was doing it perfectly or, or, or not is what it felt like. But the truth of it is, is what I realized is that when there were moments when I was not feeling as well, I had a, a playbook to go back to, to say, what does my body need? Because I know my genetics are doing this. What does my body need? Because I know I'm showing deficiencies in this nutrient. And so I was able to refocus. And I think that's really what this is. And I, and I hope that that's what I am, I am sharing with you all and expressing today is that this is about empowerment. It's about moving beyond the generalizations of take a prenatal, eat healthy, don't get too much rate, and don't be too stressed. And like, I don't know about you, but those four things immediately were trigger triggering for me. And if you Google or pick up any book, um, you know, there are some people who are trying to flip that script on its head. And we are certainly trying to do so, which is abusing back into that 
to that woman and to that, that subsequently, of course, that baby and their physiological responses um, together, that we are changing the way that their genes express because we are able to, in a way, manage their stress. Because as we know, there are significant methylation changes, particularly in DNA methylation changes when we're talking about poor stress response or unmanaged stress. Um, you know, we see it in study after study when we're talking about natural disasters. We see it impressively in studies where you're looking at, at mothers who survived genocide and their children even 20, 30 years later have PTSD, not because they experienced the genocide, but because they were in utero, which in one way was experiencing that genocide. So we're seeing these methylation changes happening we're seeing the neurotransmitter changes, the cognition changes happening because of stress. But yet, when we do simple things mm -hmm. and we can intervene, even if we can't change the stress environment, we can change the stress response, mm -hmm. then we see those, that powerful resilience come back into play for the mother. One of the ways that we also try to decrease total allostatic load that tends to be damaging is making sure that we are aware and that we're bringing awareness to the way that our environment does interact with these methylation patterns. We know that the organophosphate pesticides, we know plasticizers, we know um, BPA endocrine disruptors, these xenobiotics, we know that these have profound, profound impact on DNA methylation changes in the sperm in the embryo, we know that there are association with increased risks of obesity, diabetes. We know there's association in the, in the female for PCOS, endometriosis. And so if you're starting to go all the way back full circle to the preconception time period, when you have a woman presenting saying, I'd like to know what my genetics are to make sure that I can optimize the health of my baby, this is one of the ways that you could utilize this to ensure and really be able to direct her toward using glass more often, um, using stainless steel, uh, um, educating about how, you know, even store receipts have significant levels of BPA on them, you know, using this as an opportunity to provide education. And one of the, one of the most powerful resources that I've used in clinic um, in assessing and then evaluating lifestyle, and then uh, particularly if you're looking at toxic hygiene care products, parabens, phthalates, if you're looking at uh, just also in, you know, when you're in the grocery store flipping, flipping a jar upside down to seeing if there's plastic in it or not. I'm using the code four, five, um, one and two, all the rest are bad for you. So if the numbers on the bottom of the containers um, have that four, five, one and two, um, it suggests that there is not BPA in it. However, we are learning that um, the, the, the alternatives of BPA may have some of the same ill impact. And so just bringing awareness and starting that conversation with a woman and maybe starting with just one thing. But I also really love um, the resources that the Environmental Working Group puts out. It's called ewdg.org. Um, they put out what is called a clean 15 and dirty dozen list every year um, for pesticide, uh, fungicide, herbicide residue on produce in the United States. I utilize that tremendously um, for my, my, my folks in clinic. One of the things that I think is really important to say, Leslie, that we were not able to uh, talk about with our study was that our study was done and our clinical population is represented by about 50% Medicaid, which um, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar, um, the Medicaid population does represent a lower socioeconomic um, population in our country. Um, and, and it is estimated that anywhere from 24 to it's even all the way up in New Mexico, 78% of Medicaid, uh, or excuse me, of pregnancies are covered by Medicaid. Um, and so also understanding that the availability of these resources may be different for different women that you're seeing. Um, and so making sure, sure that we are uh, highlighting, like in the case and targeting um, with that dirty dozen and clean 15. So even for mothers that can't seem to buy organically only, they're worried about cost as an example. Um, that, that we're able to educate on how to wash produce appropriately, how to utilize vinegar washes, how to utilize even, um, you know, utilizing lemon in the water as well. Um, how do you wash your rice to decrease the exposure of arsenic? How do you, you know, all, all, all of these very simple things and tools that just with enough awareness, we can absolutely change an outcome. And I think that that ultimately is what this comes down to is awareness can change an outcome. Just like we know that nutrition can uh, 
uh, reverse disease. We know that it can prevent disease and we know it can mediate disease, but it can reverse disease. And in this case, we know that nutrition and the nutrients and the lifestyle that you adopt, particularly when you're individualizing a person in this pregnancy time period, and if that woman is carrying a, a, a female, you know that sitting in front of you, you have the eggs of the mother, the eggs of the, the daughter in utero and the eggs of the grandchild in utero as well, right? And so I think it's really important to say that sitting in front of you is a three, two to three uh, generational impact that you're having by just looking at something as simple um, and wonderfully complex as genetics. So I, you know, and I feel like I've talked enough now, but I really, my, my take home, our take home is, is that this is modifiable and that these changes in methylation are modifiable. How we optimize these phenotypes, the maternal conditions, the longitudinal outcomes that we are trying to change, because as we know, the neuro, no, especially neurodevelopmental diseases and diagnoses are on the rise. There are things that we can do about it. So excellent. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to point out that, so this, this, we were using methylation and the gene variants involved in that as an example of what is interrogated with this DNA grow baby life or grow baby um, gene variant panel. But we also cover the other systems as well mm -hmm. in this kind of detail that is synthesized into you could see those those small bullet points really doable bullet points and it covers so the genes that are involved in all of those uh all of our birth phenotypes and maternal outcomes are also involved in lipid metabolism inflammation i'm just reading from the the, the kind of the the table of contents for the gene variants there um, detoxification one and two cell signaling, MAOA metabolism, BDNF, you know, neurotrophic pathway metabolism, progesterone, melatonin, insulin sensitizing secretion metabolism, and vitamin D. Those are the, those are the powerful ones, the overlapping pieces in that Venn diagram, and they're the ones that have a redundant, consistent, doable intervention pattern that can be applied. So again, we couldn't be, we've been working with DNA Life now for almost two years. So in many ways, this has been a very, very long gestation, <laughs> but in many other ways it has, yes. But in many other ways, it is also, it is it is the beginning. Um, and and we, are in, uh, we are so grateful and so thankful for the opportunity. And so we look forward to further um, trainings. I think Catherine is going to, do email blasts and, and further education. I know Helen's up next on the doc for more training, but I do believe that we are going to, to collate a training um, to, to be able to, to deep dive into all of these different systems and to help you while you're sitting in front of, of your uh, next amazing opportunity. Thank you, ladies. That was an amazing introduction. And thank you for sharing all your experience. And the amazing thing here is that the experience is even published. So that's very, I'm grateful for that. So um, of course, a few questions comes up on the side. <laughs> and, and one of them is like, how do we how do we convince these um, how do we convince our parents to be to do a test like this and so on? And I, I would just speak from my experience in regarding um, suggesting a test to a patient that is very important to have this information on your website. So Grow Baby could be a menu or something on your website that's described because if your patients are already aware that you're using genetic testing or other, it could be even stool test or whatever, then they have read about it on your website and it's they they, they know this m might happen that you might want to uh, use something like that so that's at least my take on it do you have any uh comments on how to convince these um women to do a test so i'll start with me very often um well it's well known that more than 50 percent of people show up pregnant in the first trimester rather than getting the preconception care. And so one of the keys to getting this in in the time period that we wanted is of course in that is to, to speak to um, the um, our providers here who are um, listening in and to start talking about this way back then. 
you know, that this is that that by knowing um, people's particular gene variants, then those are that that gives us a powerful tool in which to optimize their health. So speaking about um, speaking about uh, health optimization. But the other way that I enter into this is if I see patterns in their behavior or their health patterns that suggest that there might be these gene variants involved. And so I'll say an example, the ready example that comes to mind is depression or anxiety. And I can, I know, I, I know the overlap there with many of the methylation um, genes. And so I will interrogate it that way. Uh, I'll, I'll say, boy, we know that there are um, there are ways to intervene in a in a classic standard of care medical man management model, or I'll say, would you like to look alternatively at this and just see if maybe rather than calling this a disease process, that we call it we take a look at where your where your uh, the push and pull in your whole system is, and we're going to try to rebalance this in such a way. So if we know that you have a particular vulnerability. Again, like in, in say making um, uh, methylfolate, then then we're going to know that ahead of time, and we're going to try to use the functional medicine model. We're going to try to remove the things that get in the way, particular toxins that require more of this, for example, um, to be able to be done. We're going to um, uh, figure out those um, are there deficiencies. We're going to meet them. We're going to if there is there a, is there a microbiome issue involved, and we're going to get to that. And then if we know that that gene variant is sitting there, we can use maybe supraphysiologic, uh, you know, amount of that bridging supplement in order to get to where we need to go. So very often, I, I mean, I guess we could call it a hook in a way, but it's a way, it's teaching your patients to think in this systems-based manner and know that there are other ways rather than calling it a disease to say, oh, let's take a look at this. You, you all think this way, I believe already. You know, you take a look at the function and rebalance that. Find out where your most uh, uh, powerful leverage points are. And I think that that's why, that's how these gene variants were selected. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's just, in, in, in other words, it's using using their entry point, using the patient's entry point. Basically, it might not feel like the, you know something this large is important to them, but something like managing their mood is. And then mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to be able to interrogate that. Mm -hmm. And also uh, uh, an opportunity to for the education, particularly with that Venn diagram at the end, to be able to, to show the patient how often the same nutrients are needed to, to, to increase and improve resilience in the body. Um, so it's not just a one-off in many ways. I think we all get overwhelmed by the idea of so much and so many interventions and, and, and um, you know, the choices that are made here from this test and the given opportunity to kind of use that single intervention and still allow it to be powerful, even though it's better when it's in that cascade. So. So I, another question comes up in regards to the father. <laughs> and I know we were discussing in the beginning, should both the mother and the father do a test? And can you please uh, yeah, explain why we came up to this being a mother test? <laughs> yeah. um, the short answer to that is yes. I believe that the father absolutely needs to do the test. So there is um, there is an there's an early and 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 burgeoning um, field of research um, that has to do with specifically male preconception health. Um, you know, I'll give a tiny tidbit as about why you know this is important. Um, but you know, when you're looking back at when you know when. Uh, an embryo develops in, in a female, it's in utero, but males, the development of their sperm really happen in that adolescent time period. And something as simple, um, but as, as, as intense as, as overeating or eating a heavily processed or standard American diet, Western diet foods during that adolescent time period um, changes um, the oxidative stress and, and damages DNA in that sperm for a lifetime. And we are learning that that the when sperm are damaged and we have that what is called male oxidative stress and fertility in this case, that we are seeing some, they are driving some of the exact same birth phenotypes that we we assume for were driven primarily from the mother. And so understanding the male genetics in this case can be part of, of, of a improved fertility story. 
Um, and so, and that's just one example of how, how you as a provider might think about this for both parents. Um, I also, I think it's, it's, and Leslie, you can interrupt me at any time, but I also think it's really important to, um, to recognize that the father's mood and these methylation patterns um, and the way that their mood is managed during this pregnancy as well is really important and decreasing their anxiety and depression um, moving in because and male preconceptually. and preconceptually yeah. because we it's do know that right men's brains change, change just like women's brains do, but it just happens in the postpartum time period rather than in pregnancy. Exactly. And so being able to provide more resilience for their mood preconception and during pregnancy then it would be, it, yeah, it just is, is gathering more information that allows you to be able to say, oh, we could probably, we could anticipate this. This is a vulnerability, but then this is what we do about it. So I have a lot more to say about male preconception. It's, it's a topic I am very, very excited about. It's part of the reason why we formulated our, our pre-gents um, male preconception nutrient pack was because we specifically started, we were understanding that you know, that these disease processes and these common, um, these common uh, non-communicable diseases are driving so much of the obesity, diabetes, hypertension that we're seeing in men of reproductive age. And so trying to target those nutrients and target food and genetics to change that story is, is, as, is as passionate of a topic as, as the mother's mm -hmm. health. Yeah, and just simply so, things like the changing age of your, of your, the changing demographic of the people who are trying to be fertile. Mm -hmm is um, influences the health of the sperm. And so, yeah, knowing this ahead of time and supporting it again, trying to educate toward the preconceptual time period. Yeah. yeah. So just to um, kind of, uh, let's, let's use the word timeline. <laughs> um, so, so really in preparation for um, having a health, healthy sperm and a healthy egg, you want to start of course, much earlier, like six months, preferably even before that. But then you would use more like a functional medicine approach in order for, for focusing on health optimization. So you would do like DNA health or you would you do organic test or ordinary blood test. You want to do thyroid tests and so on. And this test specifically, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is for the mother. Uh, where in some of it is of you can use preconception but for sure to understand what to do specifically during pregnancy so so there's kind of two uh, models that we are looking at there's the preconception model and then there's the pregnancy concept uh, or, or model yeah for the mother this would be both yeah this would be both but you're right for the father there's going to be a, some inclusions that are not present mm -hmm. in this particular panel yeah i believe Catherine, and maybe I'm, I'm, I might throw a curveball here and I don't mean to. I believe the male infertility genes would be add-ons or would be found in other other DNA life genetic tests, correct? Yeah, I, th I think what we kind of discussed was that the, if you want to look at the man's health, it's more you, right now you do a DNA health test yeah. to, for health optimization there. And then for the pregnancy outcome, you would use the grow baby. That may change, and we are starting this. And as as and and as you all practitioners who are working with our DNA test know, is that we have chosen now we have chosen some genes that we feel that there is enough literature uh, around, and we can say that these genes are actionable, uh, and 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 there's enough uh, supportive data to say that that these are safe genes to look at. You can say. But uh, of course, next year, we, there might be some, a new study that supports another gene, and then we might want to add that. So remember that the DNA test is not, this is set in stone. This is what it's going to be like. We will evolve. And we, of course, one of our mottos at Nordic and, and DNA Live is that we will be better next year. We, we, that's what we are striving to be always. So... And of course, we will just add that info once we, we get that. And, and you are, of course, all <laughs> free to join in and, 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 and create a wish list. Um, and then we will get our advisory board and, and our experts to, uh, to look at it and evaluate it and, and see if, it, if we feel that it fits into our profile in order to add that specific um, yeah, test. So um, I just wanted to say for those of you who already have DNA test kits in your clinic, you can just go ahead and use that and then order Grow Baby. It has been added to your um, 
practitioner profile now so you can order the tests already uh, now and the turnaround time is uh it's it's norm it's normally um now I can see Sousa if it's when we're running in Finland, but right now we are not running it in, 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 in Finland. I think we have to run it in South Africa still. Um, so, but, but some two, two to maximum three weeks, it should be really only around two weeks. Um, so uh, that's around about the turnaround time for the uh, tests. So, um, so the, it's not in USA. <laughs> so some of some brains uh, are in the US and some brains are in South Africa. And then we also have uh, the lab with brains uh, in Finland. So we are kind mm -hmm. of like split everywhere. <laughs> and thank you DHL for helping us to yeah. make this, the world smaller for sure. <laughs> So um, I had uh, another question that came up. Let me just see. Um, yeah, it was it was more in regards to these, uh, and it becomes more specific. And we will supply more training, but but it was more like on the these methyl uh, B complex tests, like. Um, because not like in in in, uh, in Denmark and in general pregnancy guidelines, it just says folate or folic acid, um, not methyl folate or methyl uh, B12s. So I guess the question was more along the lines if you see extra benefits from adding these uh, folate, uh, or oh, sorry, methyl methylated uh, B vitamins, or if you also see more like hyperactivity on these supplements. What's your experience with this? No, I, I think that um, knowing the uh, gene variant um, is very important in, in, to before you embark on making um, any more than the standard recommendations for B vitamin um, supplementation. So um, in our population, uh, we have about 50, just under 50% of our uh, population has a heterozygous uh, MTHFR, for example. But about 10 to 20 percent are homozygous, which means that they have homozygous recessive. And so that means that they have about 10 to 20 percent capability of um, producing, uh, of getting a methyl group off of the folic app of that metabolism, right? And so, uh, so that means that you have to, you either have to provide it, you have to provide it somewhere. You have to get that methyl group from somewhere. And so it tells you that you're not going to be able to get that. From, from no matter how much stimulation we try to get to that, that enzyme system, it's, it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna do it. So in those cases, then we start getting into the larger, more treatment man, you know, treatment um, levels of, of B vitamin, of methylated B vitamins. Now, the other piece of that though, is if you don't have the advantage, we, and we have for a long time not had, not all, with all of our patients, have been able to uh, provide the, that, that gene variant interrogation. And so we can make assumptions, and if uh, by uh, by their their uh, history, their their family history, and their um, physical presentation, and make and, and make an uh, evaluation that yes, maybe this person needs more of this um, methylated folic acid. Mm -hmm. The problem with having giving somebody, we don't really know all the problems with giving people um, a, something like folic acid that they have no capability of metabolizing, right? Or have limited capability of metabolizing. And so that gives us, um, it gives me uh, impetus to say, if you're gonna use folic acid, use it as a methylated type, since the prevalence of these gene variants is so high in our population. And if you can, you target it based on your gene, that personal individual gene variant response mm -hmm. or your result. Yeah. And I also think you could, you know, there's another level of deep dive here where you can utilize lab markers as well to That's really true. see if, you know, the form that is being used is functionally being used in the body versus just showing an elevated superficial um, level just by this, you know, from just looking at serum only, you know, so there's some other uh, markers, uh, common ones that 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 we are that we use, um, you know, is looking at homocysteine as an example um, in the interplay between B6 mm -hmm. 
um, B12 and folate there to see if there's adequacy. Mean perpuscular volume is another little marker we look at to, for B12 deficiency or sufficiency um, in the pernicious anemia conversation because too much folate and too much circulating folic acid can also mask B12 deficiency. So I, you know, and then there, there's transcopolamine you can look at. Um, methylmalonic acid is another one that you can look at for B12, functional B12 use in the body to really know if you're either meeting dietary needs or if the supplement form is, is right for the, the woman as well. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and um, yes, it, um, so there is a grow baby formula uh, that you, you have created and we've just been going through it here and it does, of course, these laws and regulations in different countries. And, and I'm afraid to say that um, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge having it in, in, in Europe. So Emily and I were just discussing uh, last night or was it the night before that how, um, how we have to get one so that it, it matches most countries yeah. around the globe. <laughs> so you yeah. might have to cut a toe and a heel somewhere on and, and make it the most optimal. But uh, a question came up um, like, so you wouldn't uh, do like a regular, uh, you wouldn't just take a normal uh, pregnancy multivitamin and then add on the grow baby. You would only do the grow baby program so that you don't get too high levels exactly yeah exactly yeah um you know but i also think leslie's standard line is is um, most supplements were created to do no harm when you're talking about pregnancy and thus th they have the potential not to meet the actual needs that that the pregnant woman has um and i think and thus they do harm right <laughs> and so right so I think it's also important to say that the quality of the of the prenatal vitamin and 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 I, I know that there are rules and regulations in every country. So really, you know, flipping that on the supplement facts on on its back and really looking at it and making sure that you're matching the you know needs in pregnancy and then also addressing the deficiency that might be occurring in the diet as well because the the capsule in the pill is not going to replace diet. That's really where you're going to emphasize That's first. Awesome. Um, and, and, and then the, the nutrients and the supplements will be something that you put on top to bridge that gap, um, just because there is such a significant therapeutic need yeah. for nutrients and, and pregnancy. That's exactly right. And we do re-interrogate our patients yeah. in the middle, in the middle there, in the end of the second trimester. Mm -hmm. We recheck those key micronutrients and yeah. see where we're standing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I actually, Leslie, I, I want you to just, if, if possible, if you just tell me, because uh, how, how it changes in the different trimesters, and I've, I've heard, you, you told me this, um, it, it was on one of your programs when you were talking, you were in Asia, and you were, you met this pregnant woman, and, and they were saying, oh, she's about to give birth, when you come back, she will have given birth, and you were like, no, 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 that baby is too small, that's another three <laughs> months or something. And, and the reason why the baby was so small was because they were in, in the, in the third, third trimester, the mothers in that population were not eating protein, not enough. So that wouldn't allow for the baby to grow, which make, allows for an easy pre, um, birth, of course, and, and, and less risk of the mother um, dying. And, uh, and, 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 and greater chance of, of the baby surviving the, the, um, the birth as well. But as you've uh, nicely uh, shown here, that too small for gestational age is a challenge then later in life or passed on in, into the generations. I thought that was a fun story to yeah. allude. And so exactly going through and so, so like uh, making uh, the mothers and, and fathers for that make understand that this is a program. It's just not it's just not one consultation based on one test in the beginning. You have to follow through and and understand that the need changes and we need to ensure that our patients are, are adapting to the, to the changes. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And then once they've, uh, you know, people say, well, when do you start, when do you start counseling for this? When do you start teaching it? And I feel like it's, it's, it's in this frequent, you start teaching the gamete, you know, <laughs> is when you do it. And then they, and then the, the parents learn this way of doing, and of course, mm -hmm. this way of being. And then if we can sustain any sort of habit for three to four months, it ends up being fairly durable. And then when you have your baby delivered, you've kind of got this 
mostly durable habit lifestyle change in front of you. And then you have a baby who kind of makes you stay that way because you're focused on keeping that optimum health for that baby. And that baby then no has no concept that there's any other way of being. We have, we have taken the plug out of the standard American diet in in one gestation. Mm -hmm. And so I just, that's, so that's when it really starts. And so these people grow up with that resilience. They mm -hmm. start resilient. Well, and what we learned from um, Julie, Dr. Julie Manella's work is that you do see palate development changes that are generational, depending mm -hmm. on how, what you're eating in utero in the second trimester, when babies start swallowing amniotic you know, fluid mm -hmm. into the continuum of the diversity um, and variety of the flavors that you eat all the way into breastfeeding that you have, a, you have a child who has, uh, who is more akin to really appreciating all the parts of their tongue that can receive different types of flavor. Um, simply because we encouraged and, and we promoted this idea of diversity and, and um, the continued uh, um, promotion of variety in the diet. And so the child all of a sudden doesn't have an association with an absence or all of a sudden the presentation of broccoli, like what is this? I've never seen this before. It's just, it, you know, it, it, has, it literally became something they swallowed starting at 18 weeks in the second trimester. So. Uh, I also sometimes say that the breastfeeding is kind of like a vaccination that they get these little the body kind of adapts to the to the breast milk and then they it's they, it's more tolerable later on when they are actually introduced to the broccoli that has a better taste and a completely different taste. Got it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, questions comes up and that's something that's that's Nordic that we have we have these like test pairs that we are talking about and what's a good test pair with grow baby and again um, it depends I mean if you get the mother in preconception you might want to look at hormones you might want to look at thyroid you might want to do a Dutch test you might want to do a Gannix test and so on and really work on on health optimization uh, prior to, uh, to, to, to pregnancy. And then when, uh, when the mother is pregnant or if you get the mother in after uh, the, the, the conception, then grow baby is an excellent tool and someone is suggesting like an organic acid test, so an oat test. Uh, there's also, um, we, we are offering now and we are just about to send out an, an, an authors on the metabolomics test, which allows for where you can add on vitamin D and you can add on um, uh, minerals and, and toxic elements and you can add on like uh, fatty acids and amino acids is in it already. So the more you want to know, that's quite a flexible test because you can add on what you want to and it's still just really something the patient can do at home. It's, it's a urine and blood spot, so you don't need to uh, do a full blood draw. Um, so I would probably go that way. Um, but of course, it depends on how much the parents are willing to invest in this. But it's, it's always better to invest in good health than it is to spend the money on disease later. So that's, of course, another argument in, in, in working with these um, different tests uh, to support the health of, of uh, well, both the mother and uh, the baby and the father for that matter because uh, the metabolomics test and organic acid test for sure and vitamin d is relevant for the father as well and of course then there's dna health so there's lots to work on and and really it's a question of doing your your the, the questionnaires with the with with the patients when they come in and evaluate any signs and weaknesses in regards to um that could uh, compromise the health and work with that and then this test is for <laughs> the actual pregnancy um, but of course you can support the actual pregnancy even further with other tests so it's never really too late to get started with health optimization in regards to pregnancy yeah yeah I think um, everyone is saying thank you and I hope you've been going through the notes on the side so you can see all the praise you, you uh, ladies are getting. So I just really want to say thank you very much um, for your time today. You kept most of us entertained. We were 92 people on most of the time. So thank you very much for that. And I, yeah, that's a lot. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, more knowledge uh, with you in 2021 as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. We will share the recordings and thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Oh.